here is I want to emphasize for a bit the bidirectionality of this microbial gut brain axis because so far we have focused on you know microbes coming in and affecting the brain or affecting the HPA axis of the body. But as the sticker makes clear, you know, the cortisol, for example, that is produced when we experience trauma or stress, that cortisol actually can exert effects on the gut microbiology. So there's a bi-directionality to this axis. It's not always the gut causing things to happen in the brain. Sometimes it's stuff happening in the brain, like our stress axis being turned on, that then culminates in some kind of change in our digestive tract. So what I'm going to focus on here is a study that is actually kind of very relevant uh, to you guys because this is a study that researchers did on undergraduate students uh, when they were subjected to exam stress. And so what they did in this study is they measured the abundance of bacteria in the digestive tract of undergraduate students, right? So CFU is colony forming units. If you've ever done like plating of bacteria, you're probably familiar with that term. But it's just a measure of the abundance of bacteria in the gut in this case. And they measured the abundance of bacteria in the gut of undergraduate students the week before exams started, the day before exams started, and then on the exam day and the five days thereafter. And you can see how, as we go from not being stressed prior to exams, to suddenly being stressed out by exams, and then the post-exam stress, I guess, or the lingering effects, you can see how there was this substantial decrease in the level of bacteria present in the gut, right? And this seems to be tied to uh, the stress of the exam and perhaps the lingering effects of that stress over the next five days. So again, what we think is happening, and again, the, the mechanisms are not totally well known here, but you write this exam, and so you're stressed out by it, and so there's this release of cortisol from your adrenal glands, and that cortisol likely has impacts on the digestive system, right? Cortisol, for example, might stop the, the secretion of acid within the stomach. It might be uh, it, you know, lessening the secretion of mucus within the gut, for example. We think that cortisol has these kind of effects on the physiology of the gut, and as the gut physiology changes, it might become less hospitable of an environment for these microbes to inhabit, and therefore they ultimately die and decrease in numbers. Now you might say to yourself, well, why does it matter if I get stressed out and then suddenly a bunch of microbes in my gut die as a result? Well, the reason it could matter is because as these gut microbes die away, well, that could create an opportunity for other kinds of bacteria, for example, pathogenic bacteria, to then come into the gut and now find that there's real estate available for them to take up and establish themselves. And so by being stressed out, we could actually experience, as a result, a change to the kinds of microbes that are present in our gut. And as we just talked about, as you change the kinds of microbes that are present in your gut, that can change the way your body, again, processes emotions, the mood you feel, your cognitive capacity, your ability to handle stressful responses. And so you can also imagine how a vicious cycle can kind of set up here, where you know the different kinds of microbes in your gut might make you more susceptible to stress. So now you release more cortisol, and that means more negative impact on the gut microbes, and a further change to gut microbial composition. And oh, now these new microbes make you even more stressed out. And you can quickly see how this can spiral out of control. It can spiral into things like anxiety, uh, depression, and other mental health disorders. So. Again, it's just important for us to appreciate the bidirectionality of this relationship, that it's not always the gut and the microbes impacting our nervous physiology, but in some cases, it's our stress response impacting what's happening in uh, the gut. All right, the next part of this diagram that I want to talk a little bit about is over here on the right-hand side, where it talks about the short chain fatty acids. That's what SCFA stands for, short chain fatty acids, that the microbes in our gut can produce. And these short chain fatty acids, as the diagram illustrates, can come into our body, and again, they can alter the mood, the cognition capacity of our brain, they can alter our stress uh, axis, uh, just like the set of kinds can. So let's talk a little bit about short chain fatty acids and uh, the effects. 
So perhaps the first thing to talk about here is, well, what the heck are short-chain fatty acids and how exactly are the microbes in our gut producing them? So everything starts right here with what we call dietary fiber. Uh, dietary fiber, as you might know, is basically just complex carbohydrates that we don't have digestive enzymes to digest. So the best example would be things like cellulose. Right, this abundant plant carbohydrate, most animals, including humans, we do not make the digestive enzymes necessary to break down cellulose. Right, so uh, this is why we call it a dietary fiber, because we can't really break it down, we can't digest it. Uh, because we can't digest it very well, one of the reasons we want to have dietary fiber in our diet is to create kind of a bulk of you know, waste in our gut that kind of helps us to kind of keep stimulating peristalsis and helps us maintain regularity, right? So oftentimes if you're experiencing, say, constipation, one of the first things a physician might kind of ask you is, are you getting enough fiber in your diet? Because a lack of fiber can often mean there's just not a lot of waste product in your gut, and so you don't have that nice constant stimulation of gut musculature, and you end up losing your regularity and becoming constipated. Well, the other reason that it's important to have dietary fiber in the gut is because the microbes that live in our gut, they actually do have the capacity to digest those dietary fibers. They produce the enzymes necessary, for example, to break uh, cellulose down into individual glucose molecules. The cellulose, of course, is just made up of a whole bunch of glucose. The microbes have the enzymes necessary to break the cellulose down into individual glucose. And when they do that, they will then absorb that glucose into their cells, and then they will subject it to anaerobic metabolism. Now it has to be anaerobic because there's not much oxygen present in your gut cavity. Right? Your gut lumen is a very anoxic environment. So I guess number one, we have to appreciate that the bacteria that live there have to be able to tolerate that anoxic environment, right? Aerobic, like strictly aerobic bacteria don't do well in our gut because they don't have the access to oxygen there. But the glucose that gets taken up by these gut microbes, it gets subjected to anaerobic metabolism, and the end products of that anaerobic metabolism are various short-chain fatty acids. So they give here three very common examples. Acetate, propionate, butyrate. These are all examples of short chain fatty acids. You can kind of see where the name comes from. They're fatty acids in the sense that they have you know, hydrocarbon chains and a uh, carboxylic acid group on them. And obviously they're not very long. They're you know, two or three or four carbons in length. So hence short chain fatty acids. But this is where they're coming from, right? It's the microbes in our gut digesting and metabolizing the glucose that comes from those dietary fibers uh, in an anaerobic way, these are the end products of that anaerobic metabolism, these various short-chain fatty acids. Now, these short-chain fatty acids, two things can happen to them once they're produced by microbes. Uh, one is that they can be absorbed into our body. And so they show here actually the, the transporters that are involved in that uptake of short-chain fatty acids by our gut epithelium. Uh, you see here MCT and SMCT stands for the uh, monocarboxylate transporter and or the sodium monocarboxylate transporter. So these are the transporters that allow short-chain fatty acids to be absorbed into our body. Uh, and I'll, I'll mention here too that once these short chain fatty acids come into our body, uh, they can be used as an energy source by the body. Right? That's one of their potential uses. And so, you know, if you have microbes in your gut that are really good at turning this undigestible dietary fiber into these short chain fatty acids, suddenly this, you know, this material you couldn't digest before and get any energy from you might suddenly be getting tons of energy from it if the microbes in your gut are good at uh, doing this process. So there's a whole other story here with like obesity and things that we're not even gonna talk about, or I'm not gonna talk about in detail about, I've just hinted at it here, but there's a whole kind of story there between short-chain fatty acids and obesity and, and things like that. Uh, anyways, they can be absorbed into the body through these transporters. 
Uh, or there are also various receptors expressed by intestinal epithelial cells that those short chain fatty acids can just bind to. I'm not going to get too worked up about what those receptors are. And then that can trigger those epithelial cells to release various kinds of signaling molecules. Again, I don't want to get too worked up about what the molecules are. But the idea overall here, again, not getting too worked up for all the details, is that short chain fatty acids either directly by getting absorbed or indirectly through binding to receptors and promoting the response, the, the release of these various signaling molecules, the overall effect of short chain fatty acids is that they actually have a really positive effect on our nervous system. And that's what I want to focus on. This whole list over here where they talk about the effects that short chain fatty acids have both directly and indirectly on our nervous system. And if you just kind of go through the list here, if you look at the, the neurons on top, it talks about things like increased neurogenesis, which means the ability to make new neurons, new brain cells. Short chain fatty acids increase that capacity. We're going to talk more about neurogenesis probably next week, because there's only certain parts of the brain where neurogenesis takes place. Uh, but if you increase neurogenesis, you kind of increase the capacity of the brain to make new neurons, and, and it really helps it to preserve certain brain functions. Uh, it can improve cognitive development and memory, so those all sound like wonderful things. And they can have anti-aging effects too on the neurons, so kind of slow the decline in neuronal function that might compromise our nervous function overall. In terms of their effects on the microglia and the astrocytes, which are two cells we talked about Tuesday, uh, we talked about them in the context of their ability to make cytokines and promote neuroinflammation, Note here how they talk about the reduced inflammatory signaling that happens by these cells when they are subjected to short-chain fatty acids. And so presumably that's going to help to minimize you know, kind of chronic and high neuroinflammation that we said on Tuesday has some pretty negative effects on brain function. And then lastly, it highlights the blood-brain barrier here, which unfortunately I would love to talk more about. We just don't have time in the course to do it. But this is one of the protective mechanisms of the brain. And it talks here about improved integrity and reduced permeability. Those are good things when you're talking about the blood-brain barrier. Because the whole function of the blood-brain barrier is to kind of you know, keep pathogens and, and other kind of bad molecules out of the brain, really allow the brain to kind of tightly control its environment to optimize its function. So if we can improve the integrity and reduce the permeability of the blood-brain barrier, that kind of improves the protective function of that barrier, and again, it improves brain function. So kind of what I'm hoping I showed here is that you know, short-chain fatty acids are really beneficial to our nervous system function, and since they come from the consumption of dietary fibers, we gotta make sure we get adequate dietary fiber in our diet. It's recommended that we get 25 grams of dietary fibers a day, right? This will help both with this cognitive boost and also with keeping us regular. And I'll just highlight here, and then I'll take your question, that it's really easy to know if you're getting enough dietary fiber because it's always on the nutrition facts and the food you eat, right? So you go to the grocery store to pick up some things for dinner tonight, you know, take a quick look at the nutrition facts. And look at the dietary fiber. Is there any fiber in this food I'm eating? Am I hitting my 25 grams per day? Because if I'm not, not only do I have the chances of becoming more constipated, but maybe I'm just not going to maximize my cognitive capacity either. Right? And we all want to do super well in this course, right? So we want to maximize our dietary fiber intake uh, in order to perhaps do that, take a advantage of this short chain fatty acid uh, neurological boost. Question? Right, so omega-3s, so the omega-3 fatty acids, they are long chain, uh, longer chain fatty acids. Uh, and so their effect on like nervous system function has more to do with, uh, they are key components of like the cell membranes and neurons. Uh, they also can be turned into, they can be turned into various kind of immune signaling molecules, so they can impact uh, neuroinflammation and peripheral inflammation. So uh, yeah, they, they are important things also to have in the diet as well. Uh, which again, not a lot of time to get highlighted here on nutrition facts. You can kind of rely on the manufacturers to highlight that themselves uh, elsewhere on the product. But yeah, their, their neurological effect is kind of separate from that of the short chain fatty acids. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, what I want to do next here is to actually show you a little bit of data to substantiate what I'm talking about because you know, I don't want to just be up here telling you, you know, the wonders of short chain fatty acids and, and you're kind of thinking like, oh, where does all this information even come from? So let me at least give you a little bit of empirical data here to support what I've been uh, rambling on about. This is a study uh, testing the memory of mice. And a very common way of testing the memory of a rodent is to place that rodent into a cage where it has two of uh, the same objects in it. So in this case, two yellow cylinders are in that cage. And you give the mouse 10 minutes to kind of explore those objects and hopefully become familiar with them. Then you take the mouse out of the cage and leave it somewhere else for an hour. And then you come back and you place the mouse into that cage again but now the cage has one of the familiar objects from before, the yellow cylinder, but now it has one novel object, in this case, this orange cube. You put the mouse in there for five minutes, and you record how much time the mouse spends exploring these two different objects. And if the mouse remembers the yellow cylinder, the familiar object from before, then it'll say, oh, I know you, I don't need to explore you, you I don't know, that's where I'm gonna spend my time. And so if you measure how much time the mouse spends with the new novel object relative to the old familiar object, that difference in time is called the discrimination index. The higher that value is, the better the mouse's memory is thought to be. Right? So if you remember well that yellow cylinder, then you won't spend time there. If you know it, you'll spend time over here with the orange cube instead. The more time you spend with the orange cube, compared to the familiar yellow cylinder, the higher your discrimination index, the better your memory as a mouse is thought to be. Okay, well, the data that I have here, they measured the discrimination index using that methodology in three different groups of mice. The first group here in blue, it says SE. This is the standard environment. Basically just means the mouse was kept in a pretty, you know, like basically an empty cage its whole life. Okay, just an empty cage, being given a regular diet. You can see it has a, yeah, a, a, a not great memory. The gray bars here are mice that are still in that standard environment, so they're kept in kind of an empty cage for their life, but they're being administered short-chain fatty acids, right? And so you can see that giving them short-chain fatty acids you know, basically doubles or triples their memory capacity. So that again is very much in line with what I was talking about here, that short-chain fatty acids seem to improve cognitive function. And this study with mice seems to really, you know, provide empirical support for that idea. Uh, the last one here kind of takes us off to a different uh, path for a bit, but the orange bar is EE. This stands for enriched environment. So now the mice are not being kept in an empty cage for their whole life, they're being placed in some super fun cage where there's like toys and tunnels to play with, right? If anybody has like rodents at home, this is hopefully what your cage looks like, you know? Like I used to have hamsters and we had all kinds of little wheels and tubes and you know, they had quite an elaborate setup. Now we have guinea pigs and nobody sells toys for guinea pigs and I've learned guinea pigs don't seem to give a shit if you give them a toy anyway. It's just like, where the fuck's my hay? That's all I care about. And come here and scoop my poop up. I poop every six seconds of the day. But in any case, you can see how giving the mice an enriched environment helped to boost their memory as well. Right? So again, and it's a, a, not really the main theme I'm trying to drive home here, but definitely providing, you know, rodents in this case, or even if you think about your own life or human life in general, the more we can kind of enrich the environment around us, right? Have us have things we can do, uh, the more that's gonna to help to boost our, our memory as well, right? And so you think about, uh, yeah, I, I was visiting my aunt in a nursing home recently, and you know, I was reminded there, well, just all the things they do in nursing homes, right? It's like there's a, a bingo night, there's craft nights, there's music to think. You want to do that in those places, especially because if you just kind of, you know, put elderly people in a home, you're like, here, sit in your room, and we'll come by and change your diaper once in a while. That's not going to do anything beneficial to their cognition. Right? You've got to be providing those enrichment activities uh, in order to help them maintain that cognitive capacity. One last thing I'll mention here, and I'm not going to show you the data for it because otherwise I'll just keep talking about this forever, but there are lots of studies too which suggest that as we get older, we do experience changes in the kinds of microbes that are present in our gut 
towards, uh, in, a, in a way that reduces the amount of short-chain fatty acid those microbes are producing. And so there's a lot of evidence, especially in, again, mouse-based uh, studies, to suggest that as we get older, our gut microbes may not be producing short-chain fatty acids for us as abundantly as they were when we were younger, and maybe that's a contributing factor to the cognitive decline that we very commonly experience as uh, we age. All right, the last thing I want to mention here, coming back to this diagram, uh, is I want to talk about the neurotransmitters that gut microbes can also produce. Uh, so gut microbes are known to produce uh, lots of different kinds of neurotransmitters. Right? It shows here in this diagram that they can directly, like the microbes in our gut, can directly synthesize neurotransmitters like GABA, or norepinephrine, or dopamine, and they can modify the epithelial cell's ability to produce things like serotonin, which is also a neurotransmitter. Now, the tricky thing about this is that these neurotransmitters that we know can be produced directly or indirectly through uh, our gut microbiome, uh, none of them are known to be able to cross the blood-brain barrier. So that means they likely cannot get from you know, these gut microbes into our brains. And so there are a lot of people wondering about, you know, do these neurotransmitters that gut microbes make, do they actually have any impact on our, on our mood, our cognition, our stress response, these things we've been talking about? Uh, there's a big question mark there because if they do, I mean, they'd have to find some way to get across the blood-brain barrier. Uh, and because we don't think they can, obviously we have a bit of a limited, you know, we're, we're not sure that they can have too much of an impact. So, Again, I'm not going to say much more than that. I just wanted to talk about neurotransmitters since they were part of this figure here. But this is the big question that I think remains is can the, the production of any of these neurotransmitters by these gut microbes, can it actually have any effect on the body at all, uh, at least within the brain? Maybe it can have effects outside of the brain in peripheral nervous system or something like that. Uh, but its effects within the brain are probably fairly limited by the fact that these neurotransmitters cannot cross the blood and brain barrier. All right, at this point, we are going to take a dramatic shift in terms of the content now of the lecture. Because we're now going to focus on kind of the second half of this lecture topic, which is to start talking about the cells of the nervous system. So uh, what I have here is a light micrograph image of nervous tissue. And you can see the two major cell types that make up the nervous tissue in this light micrograph image. This big cell that you see here, occupying most of the space, uh, this is, of course, a neuron, right? So neurons are one of the two types of cells that we find in the nervous system, and they are the cells that are responsible directly for the functions of the nervous system. So those four functions that we talked about last week, the whole sensory input and integration and motor output and memory, those four functions of our nervous system are the responsibility of the neurons. The other cell type that we have present in our nervous tissue, uh, you can see the nuclei of those cells here in this picture. Uh, they are the neuroglia. Uh, the neuroglia, that word, literally comes from Latin and means nerve glue. And the reason these cells were called neuroglia is because the early uh, the early investigators of the nervous system, when they discovered these cells, they thought that their function was simply to be the glue that holds the rest, the glue that holds the nervous system together. And so they referred to them as the neuroglia. Now that, of course, was you know a long time ago. Uh, we've come to realize now, in the intervening you know century or so, that there are number one many different types of neuroglia. We've already seen some of them, microglia, astrocytes. There are others that I'll introduce you to eventually. Uh, and we've also come to realize that they have a much broader role in the nervous system than to simply be a glue. Uh, they have all kinds of really interesting physiological functions. And again, we'll delve into a little bit in the, uh, the lectures to come. We've already talked a little bit again about astrocytes and microglia and their role in you know, neuroinflammation and things like that. Okay, so we've got these two uh, cell types that make up the nervous system. Uh, what's pretty obvious, I think, from this image is that neurons are substantially larger than microglia. 
And yet, despite that, uh, as it says up here in the top right corner now, uh, each of these cell types occupies 50% of the volume of the brain. And that's because even though neurons are substantially larger than the neural glia, there are five to 50 fold more neural glia in our brain than there are neurons. Right? So we have tremendously, tremendously more neural glia in our brain than we do neurons. Um, and again, when you think about the important physiological functions that these neural glia are going to be doing, you know, it really kind of underscores how neurons need a lot of help uh, to be able to do uh, the functions that they do. Now, the next thing I want to talk about with respect to uh, the neurons is I want to talk a little bit about their structure. You know, when you first uh, learn about animal cells, you know, maybe, I don't know, grade 7, grade 8, something like that, you know, the picture you're often shown is that nice, spherical animal cell, right? And of course, as you start to learn more about cells, you start to realize that you know, not that many cells in the body are actually that nice, spherical shape that my grade 7 textbook led me to believe, neurons being one of them. Neurons, of course, have a very complex structure, uh, largely because they have so many of these processes, right? They're sticking off of them in all kinds of different directions. So I want to talk a little bit about the structure of neurons here uh, for the next few minutes. And where I thought I'd start is with this image here. Uh, this image shows us uh, drawings of various kinds of neurons found in the mammalian brain. And what I love about this drawing is just, again, how it shows us the tremendous diversity of neuronal structure, right? There are so many different you know, sizes and shapes for neurons within the mammalian brain. Uh, it's just you know, fascinating to look at these drawings and to, to appreciate that structural diversity. But of course, there's one thing, I mean, scientists are kind of weird people because they love this diversity, right? I mean, you could imagine a scientist framing this picture and putting it up on their wall somewhere, Right? And then guests come and they're like, hey, let me show my picture of you know, mammalian brain neurons and talk about it for an hour. And they're like, oh, this is why you don't have any friends. <laughs> but at the same time, scientists also get really easily overwhelmed by all that diversity. And they are hell-bent on trying to classify the diversity, kind of simplify it down in some way. And so that's going to lead us to this next slide, talking about the structural classification of neurons. Right? What we're trying to do as, as scientists is take that diversity of neuronal structure and kind of boil it down into some kind of simpler, uh, kind of manageable uh, way. So on the bottom here, it tells us that there are four major types of neurons uh, based on their structure. Now, in general, the way that we classify the structure of a neuron is based on the number of processes that stick off of its cell body. So if you look at this neuron over here, the cell body is the region surrounding the nucleus, of course. And if we count the number of processes that are sticking off of that cell body, I can count six of them, right? There's one, two, three, four, five, six. Six processes sticking off the cell body of that neuron. Well, this neuron, as you can see, is called a multipolar neuron. And we call neurons multipolar when they have three or more processes sticking off their cell body. So that's, uh, that's how we classify multipolar neurons. Now, of these six processes that are sticking off of this neuronal cell body, only one of them is an axon, right? Typically, neurons only have a single axon. So they've indicated the axon here, and in this case, it's very clear which one is the axon, which process, because this axon happens to be myelinated. Right? We're going to talk more about myelination and its physiological function later in the course. But you can see that there's a myelination of that axon, which makes it pretty easy to identify. And all these other five processes are dendrites. And so again, we're going to learn probably tomorrow. Uh, we're going to talk about how axons, of course, are responsible for you know, generating and propagating action potentials to other cells, and the dendrites are responsible for kind of collecting the sensory input uh, from other cells or from the environment or whatever. Now, they tell us here in this figure two, where are we likely to find uh, multipolar neurons? So one place where we're going to find multipolar neurons is they often function as efferent neurons, which we know from earlier in the course means motor neurons. Right? So most of our motor neurons in our nervous system are of this multipolar type. 
And when you stop and think about why that would be the case, I think it largely has to do with how having kind of these multiple dendrites, right, means that this motor neuron can be plugged into the nervous system, you know, in multiple different ways. And that makes a lot of sense, because if you think about doing some kind of motor action, like, say, raising your hand, there are tons of reasons why a person might want to raise their hand. Maybe you have a question you want to ask. Maybe you want to high-five somebody. Right? Maybe you're trying to reach something that's up on a top shelf. I mean, for all of those different reasons, I might need to lift my arm up. So in all of those cases, I had to use the same muscles to get my arm up there, but of course, the kind of initiating sensory input that caused me to do that was different in each case. So one can imagine how having motor neurons kind of plugged into the nervous system you know, in multiple different ways through these multiple different dendrites would certainly allow for a single motor action like lifting my arm to be executed in response to all kinds of different kind of initiating events. The other place where we find, it, uh, find multipolar neurons is within the central nervous system. So they give us two examples here of multipolar neurons that are in the central nervous system. Uh, again, if you look at this neuron down here, we can count one process, you know, two processes, three processes, for sure four processes coming off that cell body. So we know for sure it's multipolar. Uh, but of course it looks very different from the efferent multipolar neuron here we seem to have a much, much more extensive sort of dendritic branching, for example, and actually a much, much shorter axon, too. You know, we had talked earlier in the course about you know, motor neurons having long axons, because there's only a, a single axon. If you think about somatic motor neurons, they can have big, long axons going from the central nervous system to you know, muscles that are far away from our brain and our cord. You tend to have much shorter axons on the multipolar neurons in the central nervous system, because the distances that you have to send signals within your brain is, of course, a lot shorter. But this hugely branched dendritic tree that we have here on this particular multipolar neuron, again, one can imagine how many other neurons in the central nervous system you could plug into that extensive uh, dendritic tree. And again, when you think about the central nervous system as being the major place for integration in our nervous system, Having these highly branched multipolar neurons in our central nervous system that can plug themselves in to so many other neurons within the central nervous system presumably helps us to maximize our integrative capacity, right? which in turn kind of endows us with this capacity to really, you know, very precisely in a nuanced ways respond to sensory information uh, with very complex behavioral uh, responses. I'm going to zip down here now to uh, the bipolar neurons. Uh, obviously, as you can guess, bipolar neurons have just two processes sticking off of their cell body, uh, hence their name bipolar. Uh, now, what makes them bipolar? Uh, so they're bipolar because they have two processes, but uh, if we look at these two processes, we see that one is an axon, and the other results from the dendrites kind of fusing together far away from where the cell body is, such that only a single dendrite comes back to the cell body. Right, so over here we had multiple dendrites kind of connecting into the cell body, so hence we had a multipolar neuron. But in this bipolar case, the dendrites have all kind of fused together into a single process way out here, and then only a single, that single process makes its way back to the cell body. So that's why we have, uh, that's what makes it bipolar. Uh, you can see here that bipolar neurons are for the most part found in the sensory division of our nervous system. Uh, but they're only really found in limited cases. Uh, it talks here about neurons for smell and vision. That's pretty much it. We don't really find bipolar neurons too, too commonly in our nervous system. They are very much limited generally to you know, the retina of our eye, uh, to the, the, uh, to the like, olfactory, uh, yeah, olfactory epithelium in our nasal cavity that's involved in smell. They're a fairly rare kind of neuron. Beside that, we have what's called the pseudo-unipolar neuron. So unipolar here, of course, would suggest just a single process coming off the cell body. In fact, that's what you can see here, one process coming off the cell body. But why do we call it pseudo-unipolar? Well, a true, a true unipolar neuron would just have an axon emerging from it. 
It would have no dendrites, just the nephron. All right. But here you can see that we actually do have both dendrites and the axon, according to the labeling here. So this is why they call it pseudo unipolar. What happens here ultimately is that the dendrites of these pseudo unipolar neurons, they again kind of fuse together, just like we see in the bipolar case, but then they actually give rise right away to the axon, which then happens to run right past the cell body, just kind of connecting to it with this rather small process. And so the way that pseudo-unipolar neurons develop is they actually do start as bipolar neurons, and then effectively the cell body kind of slides over to the side, so the process, you know, the dendrites and axons just kind of run parallel to it with this one little process connection, and the dendrites kind of give way directly into uh, the axon. Now, uh, one question again, we, we can see here that these pseudo-unipolar neurons are typically found as sensory neurons. They're abundant in our sensory nervous system. We think that the advantage of this kind of pseudo-unipolar structure is that it basically, again, kind of gets the cell body the heck out of the way when it comes to just relaying sensory information rapidly uh, from one part of the body to another. So you can imagine here that if you've got you know, a bunch of sensory input coming into these dendrites here, and those dendrites immediately come together and form an axon, and then that leads to an action potential that you can rapidly propagate towards the other end of this neuron, you don't have to worry about the cell body being in the way. Right? You're not going to have now any kind of, of, of slowing down of passing the sensory information uh, from these sensory receptor dendrites uh, down to whatever effector organs you're trying to, uh, to integrate. All right, so I guess I'll stop there. I feel like I'm running out of time. Uh, tomorrow we'll bring up, we'll talk about uh, a little more about these two neuron types and then the last one we have two.